future events, and they spoke on behalf of God. So sometimes God would send a prophet to simply tell people things in terms of what they need to do and oftentimes warn them of judgment and encourage them to obedience. But then there were other occasions when the prophet would foretell future events, and that's exactly what Agabus does. In fact, we're going to see Agabus again in chapter 21 when he foretells another future event. Brethren, true prophets always, without fail, if they're true prophets, they foretold things that inevitably would come to pass. Now, I say that because there are some people in our day who try to redefine what a prophet was. They say the Old Testament prophet, he had to speak the truth. predominantly for the church in Jerusalem if you keep in, uh, to keep in mind was largely Jewish in nature. So think about it like this. These newly converted Greeks in Antioch as soon as they're converted they're gathered under the leadership of Barnabas and Saul to be a congregation. They hear through the prophets prophecies that there's coming a famine and particularly it's going to impact 
those brethren in Judea, in Jerusalem. And so they, pressed from the womb of the Holy Spirit, they all, as much as they can, without exception, give of their own livelihood to assist the Jewish Christians that they've never met in Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to come back to a lot of these principles as we now turn, finally, to our fifth heading. And I've entitled it Three Descriptions of a Christian. Because I want to look back in particular to Acts 11 and the last statement of verse 26. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. It's rather interesting to notice that Luke actually adds this as a side thought. Oh, and by the way, it's here in Antioch that the disciples were first known by the name or title Christian. I say this is interesting because this has become the dominant way most believers refer to themselves. We're Christians. Within the book of Acts, believers are described by a variety of ways. Disciples of the Lord, and at least four times, followers of the way. And yet, beginning here in Antioch, largely a Gentile congregation, the disciples of Christ are called Christians, likely in a negative way. You can see how Luke puts it. They were called. That means somebody else called them Christians. It's not so much that they called themselves Christians, but they were called Christians. Christians. It doesn't seem that this was a name the believers came up with, but was imposed upon them by others from the outside. It's very likely it was a derogative term that simply described them as followers of the Christ and thus his word. Thomas Walker said the name Christian was most probably given to them by the heathen population of Antioch. Perhaps in a spirit half of jest and half of contempt. To the pagans of the city, they stood forth to view as, quote, those connected with Christ, a new cult, having him for their acknowledged head. In fact, you may know that the term Christian or Christians is only used in a totality of three times in the New Testament. It's used here in Acts 11, it's found again in Acts 26, 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And then it's, it's used in 1 Peter 4 and 16. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. So I find it interesting that a phrase that's imposed upon us likely from our enemies initially, used only in total three times in the New Testament, has become the predominant way whereby we as, as believers identify ourselves. And so the question becomes why? Why has it become so popular and even dominant to refer to ourselves as Christian and not the other ways in which we're described even more frequently in the New Testament? Well, I suggest to you the primary reason this is stuck is because it beautifully describes who we are. We are Christians. That is, we are his followers. Everything we are and have is associated with him. We are Christ's people. We belong to him. He is our head. He is our master. He is our savior. And thus, brethren, I personally love the term Christian. And I also love to refer to myself as a Christian person. Now, it's become, for a variety of reasons, popular today to disdain that term in our country. It's no longer in vogue by a lot of progressive people in our day to refer to themselves as Christian as they believe the term is loaded with Western ideology. But the problem with this is twofold. First, remember, they were first called Christians in Antioch, not New England. 
the name Christian goes back to the first century. It's not something that our Puritan fathers invented in 1620. So it's not a Western construct. It goes way back before. It goes all the way to the first century and to this city called Antioch. But secondly, wherever Christianity goes, it always, of necessity, takes a little flavor of that culture. Okay, so we have Christians in the United States of America. We have Christians in Asia. We have Christians in Africa. We have Christians in the Dominican Republic. We have Christians in Haiti. And if you were to go to all those places, they're all going to be basically the same. They're all Christians. And the threefold description that I'm going to provide here in a second is true of all of those people, irrespective of the nation, and yet each of those groups of Christians are going to take of necessity, it's inevitable, a little flavor of that culture. Let me tell you why Christians in the West have assumed a little bit of Western flavor. Because they're Christians in the West. It's inevitable. We're Westerners. If you were to go down to my wife's country, for example, the Dominican Republic, you know that that island is shared by the Dominicans and the Haitians. So if you were to go to the DR and visit a, a church, a Christian church, they're going to be just like us, though they're going to be a little different. They're going to have a Caribbean flavor to them. It, it is inevitable. Why? Because they live in the Caribbean. That's their culture. But if you go 100 miles to the west into Haiti and you go to a Christian church there, what's going to happen? It's going to take on a different flavor. It's going to take on a Haitian flavor. And if you go to Africa, you, the church there, it's going to take on an African flavor. If you go to Asia, it's going to take on an Asian flavor. Here's my point, brethren. It's not wrong. It's inevitable. You can't stop it. Christians are going to assume something of the flavor of their culture. Now we have to make sure a couple of things. One, that we don't assume the sinful things of our culture. And two, we, don't ha and we have to be careful that we don't um, impose those unique characteristics of our culture upon every other culture. So the Christians in Haiti, the Christians in the Dominican Republic, the Christians in Africa, the Christians in Asia, they don't have to be just like us. In fact, they're not going to be just like us. Now, we're all going to be the same fundamentally as Christians. That's what unites us. But we're Christians in the West. They're Christians in the East. Others are Christians down in the Caribbean. Thus, I get offended, quite frankly, when this newer generation, and it's almost exclusively a generational thing, they don't like to be called Christian because that's Western. I'm just a follower of Jesus. Well, you can call yourself a follower of Jesus. That's what a Christian is. Or you can just call yourself what we've called ourselves for 2,000 years, Christians. Christians who live in the West or East, South, and or North. So what I want to do in the remainder of our time is suggest a threefold description of a Christian as found in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 30. But before I come to that threefold description, I want to first suggest five things that the term doesn't mean. All right? So five things that do not make you a Christian, <coughs> excuse me, and three things or three descriptions of a true and actual Christian. Five things that doesn't render you a Christian and a threefold description of a true one. Number one, you are not a Christian simply because you're a citizen of a country largely founded by Christians. 
Now, I have to say, let me back up for a second. I, I said that I'm offended at that generation of people, that group of people who disdain, who dislike the term Christian. I don't want to take that back. But I can't understand, in some part, their reluctance. Because the term has been watered down and abused. So I would say let's just be clear on defining what it isn't, that's what we're going to do, and then what it is. First of all, you're not a Christian simply because you're a citizen of a country founded largely by Christian people. Now this may not be as popular as it was 20 or 40 years ago, but for many people to be American is to be Christian. And it's true, many of our founding fathers were Christian, or at least they were mostly professing Christian. And it's also true that our country has been built upon many Christian principles as found in the scripture, even as we saw again in our Sunday school class. And brethren, this isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. Would to God that our leaders would return to Christian or biblical principles. But you know what? If every one of our present leaders would become Christian and they would again govern this nation according to the scriptures, that would not automatically mean every citizen is a Christian. Some of you will remember uh, months ago, I guess, many months ago, in our study of church history, we studied uh, the Roman emperor by the name of Constantine. And Constantine, if you remember, became a Christian in the early part of the 4th century, around 335, and he eventually made Christianity the formal religion of the Roman Empire. It was really radical. Entire villages, towns, and cities were baptized as Christians. In fact, the word Christendom was coined. But let me ask you, did making these lands Christian actually make the citizens Christian people? Well, they were nationally Christian in some sense as the nation or as the empire of Rome was Christian. But brethren, you can be born and bred in a country that was founded exclusively by Christians and has been governed by Christian principles, which are not, those are not entirely true of our country, but they are in some sense, and still not be a Christian. Being an American is a privilege. It is. And that's why there's a lot of people trying to get into our country. There's not a whole lot of people trying to get out. Would to God that some would leave, frankly. If you don't like it, go. It's okay. Nobody's keeping you here. Why is it that people want to come here? It's because of the prosperity our country has known, largely, largely because of basic biblical principles. Blessed be God for the privilege of being reared in a country largely founded, not exclusively, by Christians and not perfectly but generally governed by biblical principles. But brethren, for all that, that doesn't make you Christian. Secondly, you're not a Christian simply because you've been born into a family with a Christian father and or mother. Now again, to be born into a family where one of the parents, or ideally both of the parents are Christian, is an extreme benefit for which we all should give thanks. And it's also true, and I think proper, for believing parents to refer to their homes as Christian and or even their family is Christian. We're a, we're a Christian family. This is a Christian home. But just because I say as the father and head of my house that my house is Christian, my family is Christian, it doesn't necessarily mean every member of my home is Christian. It just means that I'm governing my home according to Christian principles. Just like if we had a, quote, Christian nation, if this nation was Christian, that is, it was ruled by Christians and governed by Christian principles. We could say it's a Christian nation. Quote, unquote. 
And I have no problem, brethren, speaking of my house as Christian. My house is a Christian home. That doesn't mean everybody in it is necessarily Christian. It does mean that it will be governed by Christian principles without exception. Brethren, we have to remember saving grace doesn't flow in bloodlines. It isn't hereditary or generic, uh, genetic. Saving grace doesn't come through bloodlines. Now it's true God oftentimes saves his people through the influence of families. I'm, I'm in total agreement with that. And we raise up our children as Christian children in a Christian home believing that God is going to make them Christian. But it's the latter point of that sentence that has to be underscored. They have to be made Christian. They don't come out of the womb saved. They come out of the womb lost. They have to be found. They have to be born again. Nobody goes to heaven without being born again. Yes, being born again in a Christian home can be, in terms of our experience, a gradual experience. But stop and think about it. The new birth isn't a gradual experience. It's an event that happens in time. You're born again. But in terms of realization and experiencing that new birth, it can be gradual, especially if you're reared in the context of a Christian environment. So we're not looking for our children to necessarily have a Damascus experience like Saul or even an exact experience like I had who can pinpoint the very second I was converted. It's possible that it comes gradually in terms of realization. But if it comes gradual with regards to realization or abruptly in terms of a radical conversion, it has to come. Because being born in a country that's largely been founded by Christian people and governed by Christian principles isn't enough. And nor is it to be born in a Christian home. Blessed be God for the privileges of both. But neither are sufficient to get you to heaven. You're not a Christian just because you were born in America. And you're not a Christian just because you were born to Christian parents. You have to be born again. Thirdly, you're not a Christian simply because you've been taken to church from the time you were born. And again, brother. Being taken to a church from the time you were born is a privilege that I can hardly fully explain. I don't know of anything more wonderful than to be born in a country like ours, even better than that, a Christian family, and equally as important as that, being taken to a Christian church every Sunday. But remember the very definition of ecclesia, the church. What does the word ecclesia mean? Ecclesia, called out and assembled ones. That's what the church is. The church is comprised of those who've been called out of the world and gathered together in Christ, plainly, plainly put. All right, so does that mean that our Children, as they're born, because they're not born, called out of the world and gathered to Christ, is that to say that they're not a part of the church? In one sense. They're not a part of the church until they're converted, until they're called out and gathered to Christ. But brethren, that doesn't mean that we don't allow them to, to own the church as theirs and to speak of the church as theirs as they're young up. We just make sure we understand, sweetie, that is true. That is your church. This is your church. These are your brethren in some sense. I get that. Those are your pastors. I have no problem with that. We taught all our kids that. I love it when the young kids come to me and call me pastor or speak about our church. Because in one sense, it is your church. But in another sense, it's not fully your church until you're baptized into it. When you're baptized into it, 
Now this is your church in the fullest sense of that term. Brethren, don't get me wrong. I'm, as Baptists, we believe that our children are unbelievably privileged. We believe that just as much as the non-Baptist. And I can even go so far to say I also agree with our non-Baptist brethren that this is my family's church. My family's Christian in the broad sense. I'm raising it to be Christian. I'm governing it as Christian. And I'm bringing it to a Christian church. And I loved it always. When all my little children, I don't care how young they were, they spoke of our church. And I never, ah, sweetie, you can't say ours, not until you're baptized. Oh, they were told that from the pulpit, and they were told that from the couch on a number of occasions because it's the truth. But it warmed my heart when they speak or spoke of heritage, RBC, as theirs, and the pastors as theirs, and the brethren as theirs. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but let me underscore my point. You're not a Christian just because you're brought to church from the beginning of your existence. You have to, from the heart, own the head of the church as yours. That's what a Christian is. Fourthly, you're not a Christian simply because you're living by moral principles found in the Christian religion. This is how many people think of a Christian. A Christian is someone who tries to live by the golden rule. Again, this is becoming less popular in our country, but nevertheless, it's still there. A Christian is somebody who waits until they're married to have a baby, doesn't smoke this or doesn't drink that, doesn't do this and doesn't do that. And probably a lot of those things are good to do or not to do, for sure. A Christian person does try to live by the golden rule. But a Christian person lives by the golden rule, that is to do unto others as you'd have them do to you, out of gratitude for their Savior. Why is it that I want to treat others as I'd be treated? But because Christ has rescued me from my sins. So I'm not just trying to be a good boy or a good girl. I want to be a good Christian by the grace of God and for the glory of Christ. Fifthly, you're not a Christian simply because you believe in God and are not an atheist nor agnostic. Do all Christians believe in God? Of course. But can you believe in God and not be a Christian? Yes. Yes. Remember what James said. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Brother, these are things that don't prove you're a Christian. And I think there's a lot of confusion, isn't there? As there always has been and always will be about the nature of Christianity. Well, that brings me then, finally, to the positive. If these things are not of certain in terms of making you a Christian, then what is? If these things are not necessarily true of every actual Christian, what are things true of every Christian without exception? Well, again, I want to suggest to you that we find three descriptions of a true Christian found in the passage. In verse 21, first, they turned to the Lord. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. I mentioned last week in considering verse 18, the phrase that God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life, that repentance and faith are always connected. To repent is to turn from, and to believe is to turn to. And where there's the one of necessity, there's the other. Thus, every Christian has turned from something, and every Christian has turned to Jesus for something. What have we turned from? Well, I said last week, ourself. We've turned from trusting ourselves and living for ourselves. 
What have we all turned to Jesus for? Well, salvation. Salvation from the penalty, power, and the promise of being saved ere long from the presence of sin. So every person who's turned to the Lord has of necessity turned from themselves. And only those who have turned to the Lord are Christians. Have you turned to the Lord? You say, I, I, I've been born and raised in America. That's good. My mom and dad are, are, are Christians. That's good. I've been in church nine months before I was born. Amen. What a blessing. I haven't had babies out of wedlock. I don't smoke crack or get drunk. Those are good things. I believe in God. I'm not an atheist. Good. So do the devils. But have you turned to the Lord? You say, but how does somebody turn away from themselves and come to God in Christ? By the hand of the Lord. By the powerful, almighty hand of God. He's come down and he's turned you to the Lord. Secondly, verse 23, they continue with the Lord. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all with, uh, with purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. I've said many a times over the years that we don't merely need Christ to become Christian, but we also need Christ to live as Christians. I fear a lot of Christians have a faulty notion on this point. They think that we turn to Jesus and we need him for salvation, but then we don't need him anymore after that. We just need him initially and then we do the rest by ourselves. Well, my friends, that's obviously, that's obviously contrary to verse 23. Barnabas encouraged those who had turned to the Lord to continue with the Lord. Brother, I find this to be a, tremendous, a tremendously encouraging and instructive phrase. Continue with the Lord. I've turned to the Lord by God's grace. His hand turned me back in January of 94. I've been turned to the Lord. And by his grace ever since, I've continued with the Lord. You see, a Christian isn't somebody who just walks an aisle and says they're Christian. And then they go back and live any old way they want to. No, if you've really turned to the Lord, you will of necessity. If you've really turned to the Lord, you will of necessity continue with the Lord. Now, let me ask the question. What then specifically does continuing with the Lord entail? What does it mean to continue with the Lord? Or perhaps I could even put the question like this. How is somebody to continue with the Lord? What does it mean to continue with the Lord? Well, one, it means to continue with his spirit. Listen to these words, Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish? Ha having begun by the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? You started the Christian life by the powerful hand of the Holy Spirit. He brought you to Jesus out of grace. You came to him for grace and strength. You didn't look to yourself for merit or salvation. That's how you started it, by the Spirit. And are you now become so foolish that you're going to continue on without the Spirit? Brethren, to put it plainly, to continue with the Lord means you continue trusting Him. You continue relying upon Him. You continue to look to Him for grace and for strength. How was it that you turned to the Lord in the first place, of your own strength? The text says you turn by the hand of God. 
You are saved by grace. This is what Paul means in Galatians 3.3. 3. And you're sanctified by the same grace. You needed Jesus to become a Christian. And you equally need Jesus as a Christian. Brother, how else are you to live the Christian life but by faith in Christ? You're saved by faith in Christ alone. You're sanctified by faith in Christ alone. Now, faith functions differently in our justification and sanctification. In our justification, we come to Jesus merely empty-handed, and we receive by faith. In our sanctification, we come by grace to Jesus, and we receive from Jesus by faith, and we work for Jesus by faith. But it's all by faith. And at the root of that, brethren, it's all grace. Have you become so foolish? You've started by the Spirit, and are you really thinking that you're going to continue by your own strength? In fact, the phrase here, continue with the Lord, skip over to chapter 13 and notice how Barnabas puts it in verse 43. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Brethren, to continue with the Lord is one and the same to continue in the grace of the Lord. Friends, don't get it wrong. We work in sanctification. We don't work in our justification. But even though working in our sanctification is all gracious, So we're justified by grace, we're sanctified by grace, and we're going to be glorified by grace. We've come to Jesus to be saved from sins. Penalty, justification, power, sanctification, presence, glorification, and it's all grace. Continue secondly with his word. Listen to what Jesus said in John 8 and 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide, continue, or remain in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Now notice Jesus doesn't say you have to continue in my word to become my disciples. He says if you continue in my word, you are my disciples. Here's the point. Every true disciple, every true Christian continues with the Lord, and that means in his word. What does that mean? Well, that means that you believe and obey scripture. My friends, somebody who doesn't abide in the word, remember what John said in 1 John? He's not a Christian. Christians abide in the word. That means they always believe it. Now, do they always understand everything? No. But they believe it. They believe the scriptures. They believe the Old Testament and the New Testament are the infallible, inspired, sufficient, all-powerful word of God. And if you don't believe that, my professing Christian, you're not a Christian. I just don't really believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I just don't really believe that he was God. I don't believe in a real hell or actual heaven. I don't believe God created all things. I used to believe that. But I don't believe that. Christians don't have to believe that anymore. You hear that, don't you? I heard it again just afresh this last week. Christians have evolved. They used to believe 
in eternal suffering of the wicked in hell, said this person. Who believes that anymore? They used to believe that sodomy was a sin. Who believes that? In fact, that was the actual particular point in discussion. It used to be that Christians had to believe that sex outside of marriage was sinful. Nobody believes that anymore. Christians had to believe that sex between men and women was sinful. Nobody believes that anymore. It used to be that Christians believed that abortion was murder. There's a lot of Christians that don't believe that. Well, my friends, here's why. There's a lot of Christians that no longer believe those things because there's a lot of Christians who aren't Christian. You can't be a Christian. You cannot be a Christian and not continue with the Lord. And that means with his word. You no longer believe that abortion's murder You no longer believe sodomy is a perversion. You no longer believe adultery is sin and fornication. Then my friend, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, then that evidence is the fact that you are my disciples indeed. That means simply put, you're true Christians. Christians continue with the Lord. They continue with his spirit. They continue with his word. Thirdly, they continue with his people. Listen to how John put it. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, listen, they would have continued with us. Now, brethren, obviously this doesn't mean if somebody leaves our church and goes to another Christian church that they've left the faith. But those who continue with the Lord, they equally continue with his spirit. That is, they live by grace. They walk by the spirit. Two, they abide in his word. And three, they gather with his people. Oh, but Pastor Waters, we no longer are so rigid in our Christianity. Gone gone is the religion of our grandparents where we gather with God's people on the Lord's Day to worship him according to his word. We go to church if we feel like it. In fact, we really don't even have all of that structural stuff called religion. That's religion. We we got spirituality, relationship. All the rigidness of the old is gone. I, I go to church. In fact, I don't really even believe that we need church anymore. Brother, how many supposed Christians in our country think that way? Let's rethink church. Well, if that means you might get a bigger piano than a, or a smaller piano, you might alter some of the hymns, you might structure things a little differently, that's fine. But my friends, if you're a Christian, you will never, ever attempt to restructure church in the full sense of that term. And again, I don't care if you're first century or 21st century. I don't care if you're Africa, Asia, or European. I don't care where you're at. Church is church. It's the collective body of God's people who gather under officers called elders and deacons with a definable membership to worship God according to his word. That's what church is. And my friend, if you think you no longer need that, and the longer you go without that, the more everyone around you has reasons to believe that you very likely may not be a true Christian. Because Christians know that they need the public means of grace and they love 
the people of God. This is another thing, isn't it? That's become popular in our age. And it just saddens me to no end, brethren, how so many Christians today like to just bash the church, throw it under, under trample it under their feet. All the church hurt folk. I was a part of a church once. The pastor said that I couldn't live with my boyfriend. And I had to get married or I couldn't be a member. And then I came to realize that church really isn't a necessity. That it's kind of a give or take. Not a true Christian. Ne'er a true Christian thinks like that. Because everybody who's a Christian, they continue with the Lord. His grace, his word, and his church. But there's a third thing here. They love, <clears throat> thirdly, verse 29. They love those in the Lord. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. No sooner was the church established in Antioch did these newly converted Christians begin to love other Christians, albeit different Christians. They were in a different city, of a different nationality, and they didn't know them from Adam. Remember, 1 John says over and over again, we know that we love God and that we've been born again because we love the brethren. Friends, I'm as Reformed Baptist as it comes. And I personally don't have any problem calling myself such. I'm a confessional Baptist. I'm Reformed Baptist. But you know, more fundamental than that, I'm Christian. I think this is in part one reason why the name has stuck over the years. Because it really unifies us irrespective of our differences. And brethren, there are differences. But here's my point. If you've turned to the Lord, and you're continuing with the Lord, and you love the people of the Lord, then you're a Christian. And if you're a Christian, you're my brother and my sister, irrespective of differences. Oh, thank you. I got water here. Brethren, there's only actually one true church. And that's the Christian church. And guess who are members? Those who turn to the Lord, those who continue with the Lord, and those who love the people of the Lord. All of those, irrespective of our differences, are part of the Christian church. And everybody else who might claim to be a part of it, but aren't those things, I don't care what they are in name or profession. They're not, in fact, Christian. And listen to me carefully. They're not my brother or my sister. And they were first called Christians in Antioch. Let us pray. Our Father, we do bless you for the grand privilege of being called Christian, followers of the Lord Jesus, disciples of our Lord. And we thank you how this title is so universally applied to all believers who've turned to the Lord, continue with the Lord, and love God's people because of the Lord. And thus we ask that you would encourage us as your beloved people to know that we are in fact and not merely in name, Christians. Granted our Father, we pray you, for Jesus' sake we ask, amen.
for a closing hymn, we're going to stand to sing a projected hymn, Lead Me to Calvary. Let's stand, please. <laughs> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace for the sake and in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> 